Hello and happy National Nurses Day. Um, I am Mary Marshall Clark, the director of the Center for Oral History Research at Columbia University, where I've worked for nearly 30 years in the field. We are located in Insight, an interdisciplinary center integrating the work of social science, medicine, sociology, and oral history to understand all the ways that society works and to understand when it doesn't, why it doesn't work when it fails to work. Through this working group, supported by the Columbia Center for the Study of Social Differences Initiative, Women Creating Change, we have completed the first phase of an oral history project named Frontline Workers, Leaders in Pandemic Response. We're so grateful to the Center for the Study of Social Difference to allow us to convene such a diverse group. Our working group is a collaboration of nursing leaders, both in the US and West Africa, experts in public and global policy and medicine, and the humanities. You will meet them shortly. In oral history, we like to say that we need all the disciplines to understand the complexities of the human person and of the networks and communities that are created to sustain us and our world. Never has that been more needed than now. Through our oral history project last August, in 2019, 39 interviews were conducted, 19 in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and 20 in Monrovia, Liberia. The interviews were created, performed by an international group of nursing leaders who are the trusted knowledge bearers, both in their communities most effective and also by WHO and other global entities and this, the year of WHO's year of the nurse, as one of our nurses commented, well, this really is 2020, the year of the nurse, ironically. The interviewers, the incredible interviewers, are Jennifer Dorn, Annette Mwanza Kwani, Margaret Lamaviri, and Susan Michael Strasser. 34 of the people we interviewed were women, often midwives as well as nurses, and five were male nurses. Two of the nurses that we interviewed were themselves Ebola survivors, and almost everyone we interviewed lost someone. Why did we undertake this study? From the beginning, we intended to both create a lasting archive of the stories we captured to commemorate those who committed their lives to facing Ebola on the front lines. And secondly, to learn from these interviews to form new recommendations for national and global policy leaders so that no one at that time we thought would ever have to be that devastated again, that, that unprepared again, that lonely and isolated again. I say this very soberly given the crisis we are all in now. Why oral history? Oral history is the oldest and most global means we have to understand the full spectrum of human experience and to learn from those experiences. In recent times, oral history has been applied to what people, to people who have experienced disaster and catastrophe and what they can teach us. In framing our work, we turn to the testimonial archives developed after genocides and wars and in developing techniques for capturing in natural language as well as sociological analysis, the insights we can gain there. In the language of oral history, especially as it relates to cultural memory studies, we call those who told Ebola stories to us last summer, the first witnesses, the Cassandras who have tales to tell that are sometimes, in fact, often not heeded. In that sense, the stories we captured about Ebola in West Africa read now like prophecies. The work we are doing tonight with your collaboration and input is translate the work of translating prophecies into policies. The nurses we interviewed in West Africa who are now facing the COVID-19 pandemic as we are. I will leave you with a metaphor as we turn to listening to these stories. A health worker I interviewed last week said, it is like we, the health workers, are a sea of ants standing on our hind legs, facing into a cyclone. The interview was video and he pushed his hands up and his body back. 
our thanks for those incredible nurses and midwives who already stood in that storm in 2014 in West Africa, the worst of the Ebola epidemic at its height, and to those who stand together now facing the cyclone of COVID. Let's listen, and I will write down your questions. The speakers will speak for the next 35 minutes, and we will, you will have 20 minutes to send in your questions and for me to suggest people to respond. Thank you so much. Uh, before, uh, next up is, I have the great pleasure of interviewing, I mean, uh, introducing you to Jennifer Dorn, who's a core member of our group and is the director of the Office of Global Initiatives at Columbia and an assistant professor in Columbia Nursing, where she teaches community health. Equally importantly, she's been a long-term midwife um, and she, she worked in a midwifery center founded by Ruth Lubick in the Bronx. Um, and she's just been all over the world teaching and training nurses and midwives for her whole, uh, her, her whole professional life. Look forward to hearing from you, Jennifer. Thank you, Mary Marshall. Greetings to all of you on this week of International Nurses Day and International Midwives Day. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. My name is Jennifer Dorn. I've worked as a nurse midwife in Southern African countries during the HIV pandemic and as a professor teaching global health equity and the responsibility of the nursing profession, I have examined with students the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea from 2014 to 2016 and the frontline efforts of nurses and midwives. One of my heroes is Josephine Finde Selu, deputy nurse matron at Kenema Hospital in Freetown, Sierra Leone, whose face captured my attention in August 2014 on the front page of the New York Times. And you can see me and her here with a picture of, of her from the New York Times. The picture whose face, uh, her face captured my attention and her personal protective mask did not cover the tears coming down her cheeks as she told us that half of her nursing staff had died from the Ebola viral disease. It was my great honor to sit face to face with her last August, 2019, tell her how her work has impacted the careers of hundreds of students and finally record her story. Now we treasure a deep friendship. Josephine grew up with strong women who nurtured her in caring for others. Her grandmother was the village traditional midwife and community healer and an expert in the use of medicinal herbs. She told me of waking up in the morning to the cries of newborn babies that Grandma Hawa had helped birth during the night. This knowledge was passed on to Josephine's mother and then to Josephine, who would accompany her grandmother Hawa into the bush to gather fruits and plants for treatments, line of women healers. Josephine told me about being on the team with the first identified Ebola case in Kenema. A woman had come to the war, ward for care following an abortion. The midwife provided the needed services and reported to Josephine the next morning that she was concerned that the sight of the IV in the woman's arm kept oozing blood all night. Josephine went to see the patient and was alarmed. She called her colleague, the esteemed Dr. Sheikh Omar Khan, the head infectious disease doctor in the country, who came to see the woman and immediately told the nurses to put on protective gloves. Ebola viral disease, disease had come to Kenema. Two months later, Dr. Khan became infected. Josephine went to visit him and stood across the barriers as they could wave at each other. They both cried. He died two days later, a tragic loss for the country. Josephine went into action. First, she had to learn about prevention infection control from her colleagues at the World Health Organization. Listen her, to her talking about personal protective equipment. I bought the PPE that you are seeing me that I wore for that uh, New York Times. I bought it with my own money. I bought the books with my own money because I know what I have read that um, these viruses, if they, if they enter, if you go with your naked body, I have my children, I have one biological and two adopted, I have to go home and meet my family. So I don't want to infect my family, so I decided to buy these things. When I go to my office in the morning, 
I change. I wear my suit, tie my head. You see, I, I prepare it. I told my tailor to prepare it. The picture that I seen, I prepare it for myself. It was even so, I prepared two. One was long sleeve, mm -hmm. long one, and the other one is short. Made something like cap to tie my head. I was having this dread on mm -hmm. my head. The minute they do the outbreak, when I started entering, I removed it. I when we had this outbreak, thank you. As an agent of change, Josephine began training her staff in all precautionary measures. Their hospital was transformed into an Ebola treatment unit. She was there from the start and finish of all three shifts each day, caring for the nurses, teaching them the importance of the proper use of personal protective equipment, making sure they had the supplies and were donning and removing the gowns, face shields, gloves, boots, according to WHO guidelines. Josephine was an adamant advocate to ensure that all nurses had PPE and would be prepared for future outbreaks of infectious diseases. Josephine was a leader in identify, identifying the emotional and mental burden for the nurses who were on the front lines providing care under extremely challenging conditions. She had witnessed the death of Dr. Khan and so many nurses, and she shared with me how this took a toll on her. A social worker urged her to take a rest. At first she resisted and only reluctantly agreed. With sleep and food and time, she felt reinvigorated. Her own experience with exhaustion and depletion led her to implement interventions for staff. Listen to her explain. The next clip, please. And so after that, by then when I came back, two weeks now, when I came back, the tempo has reduced and then we started encouraging the other nurses now to go for recess. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I also shared my experience. I said, since this is what happened, and so you also have worked all this while. So can we do it a routine so that few people, three or few can also go and rest? So that's how I also initiated it and then started going for it. I asked Joseph. Well. Thank you. I asked Josephine how she did this for two years, how she kept going back to Kenema and lead the nurses through the response in the midst of so much suffering and death, how she found the courage and strength to keep going. She told me, next clip. Uh, the courage is the love for humanity, the love for my people, because as a head nurse by then. If I were to run away, to leave the unit, all those other volunteers, some of them just trained one year ago, two years ago, and I have been in the field for 20 years as a nurse. And head nurse, if I am to run away, eventually all of them will run away. So I decided to stand by them, give them courage, to see how we can help our people. The courage for humanity, the love for man mankind gets me going. Josephine Findicello's story guides us on what is central to nurses today in our global response to the coronavirus pandemic. The importance of adequate PPE for all frontline health workers, the critical role that nurses play in infection prevention control, the need for sound mental, emotional support for frontline workers to prevent burnout and long lasting trauma. Thank you, Josephine, with recognition and gratitude. My name is Margaret Kiri. I'm a Malawian by nationality and nurse and midwife by profession. I am here to share with you my story of how I actually got involved in this project of listening to the frontline workers, the heroes who participated in the fight against Ebola in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Just a little bit about my experience. 
in my nursing and midwifery role and as a leader. I happened to have the opportunity to work in Sierra Leone during the recovery phase in 2015 up to 2017. During that time, although the Ebola epidemic was almost towards the end, I learned a lot from the colleagues with whom I interacted. Before then, I'd been a leader on global level. I worked for WHO for the longest at regional office, but I also had the opportunity to work for Exacom in Exa Health Community and the other organizations to which maybe I may not have to time to mention all of them right now. All right, let me take this opportunity to introduce um, one of the frontline workers, one of the heroes whom I interviewed when I went to Sierra Leone, and his name is Horace Yandone. Now, Horace, can you just tell us a little bit about why you decided to become a nurse? Why did you become a nurse? It's a passion, something I grew because you're not the first to ask me, some of my colleagues who are doctors now. Mm -hmm. They saying, Horace, you're bright enough to be a nurse, so I come and do a doctorate. I say, well, in terms of care, my mom was not really a like nurse, but she was a nurse at home. You know what that means? Yes. And I saw all what she was going through. I decided that a good passion for nursing, not going in other fields, because you know what I should have gone to the commercial or be a banker, make fast money, but I want to serve humanity. That's really what made me to go into myself. That's very good. Humanity. That's very good. Horace was a um, wonderful and dedicated leader when he was given the responsibility to manage the treatment center for the Ebola patients. And he had the opportunity, based on the needs, to introduce working in shifts as one way of making sure that the staff on the ward had the opportunity to have time to rest in between. So they said, no, no, no. The hospital should have a three shift system. That is to say, we don't operate on 12 hour basis. A single nurse cannot be exhausted in the morning till in the afternoon. Let's have a yeah. three shift system. Then I drew up the whole staff for the three shift system. There we have now the three shift. Nurse eight to two, two to eight. Then the other shift starts from eight to six to seven in the morning, 7.30 before the others take over. Then the three shift system was perfectly in place. Then also we said, forget about the three shift system now, it is working. We have staffs at that time now, we have been equipped with more nurses. You know. We have staffs now, let's see that the words are not left idle. That is to say, every hour, nurses goes in. If there is nothing to do, but you want to check on your patient and you come out. Another strategy I will use is these people don't have recreation and they are not enjoying nothing so far. Mm -hmm. Let's do something for them. I just want to share with you is that for us to lead is personal commitment and conviction to serve. So it's not about money, but it's about what we believe in to save other humanity. And I think it's from this that Horace shared with me what made him keep going in what he was doing. Let us hear from him about what he thinks we can learn from his experience. I want my voice to be heard. I want to be recognized that I am, or I was one of the fighters, but these medals were not given to people like us, like nurses, mm -hmm. never. But people were giving me that they didn't even touch an Ebola patient. I'm talking it from the general perspective. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. People were called on state television, giving me that, 
that never went into a treatment center. What about those that kill themselves at the treatment center? How are you encouraging them also? Hi, should I begin, Jeremy? Yep, good to go. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and thank you to the Center for Social Difference and to our team of On the Front Lines uh, for inviting and um, planning this webinar. We hope that you uh, find it informative and obviously it is very salient given what we are experiencing right now. My name is Susan Michael Strasser. I'm an assistant professor of ep epidemiology at uh, Columbia at the Melman School of Public Health and the director of human resources for health for ICAP at Columbia University, where we have programs in over 30 countries providing uh, support to ministries of health and districts to scale up a wide variety of services in, primarily starting with HIV, but now extending to many other areas of work. And I'm also a nurse, which is the most important. <laughs> These past six weeks have been very unsettling, uh, to say the least, unsettling on many levels. We've had so many meetings, we had so many meetings and, and events planned to celebrate this year, the bicentennial of Florence Nightingale's birth and the WHO declaration of 2020 as the year of the nurse and midwife. That excitement quickly turned to action as the COVID-19 pandemic began to rage. Having lived and worked in Africa for 14 years and during the height of HIV in the late 1980s through to the 21st century, I did not think I would be on the front lines of anything else like that in my lifetime. I saw the power of nurses and nursing as we cared for the sick and dying without any treatment and limited infection control equipment. I thought those days had passed. During the 2014 Ebola outbreak, I led an evaluation in Sierra Leone of a new model of care led by communities called the Community Care Center. These centers, largely run by nurses, were implemented at a time when the Ebola outbreak was widespread, entering the capital Freetown, and efforts to contain the virus's spread proved wildly insufficient. I was humbled by the many health workers that rushed into care when they didn't have the training, they didn't have the personal protective equipment, but they went in out of their um, calling and belief in humanity and belief that they had to show that they were there, that they were there to care uh, for people. Many lessons have been learned from that time and from the efforts and innovations of many brave frontline health workers and communities. We'll now hear from one of them. It is my honor and privilege to share the thoughts and wisdom of a colleague working at the front lines in neighboring Liberia. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, the voice of Harry's takes on a special significance as history, once again, repeats itself. As the wisdom, lessons, and voice of nurses continue to go unheeded, experiences like Harry's are being repeated across the globe and here in the United States. Harry's is a hardworking father and husband of four who's currently working two jobs to make ends meet. We meet after he has come off of a 24 hour work day. Although exhausted, he came to share his story. Please listen now. How, how was your experience as a nurse with the community? Well, I, before they tried to stigmatize me, mm -hmm. and just imagine my wife says, since you decide to go and work, we don't want you to come here stay to where you are mm -hmm. until after Ebola. Wow. Yeah, so I only used to communicate with them on the phone. So you stayed away from your home? I stayed away from my home. I was just on the compound there. Do you have children? Yes, yeah. I get two boys, two girls. 
So despite the st stigma, Harry's decided to continue work and re remain at the Ebola Treatment Center, living there for an extended period of time. This father of four exemplifies the actions of so many nurses, providing care and treatment that goes beyond the disease itself and the hospital or health center. Harry's new stigma and therefore went into communities helping recovered Ebola patients re-enter their communities. Yes, we did that. We even used to follow up those that the, the ET used to discharge. Because one of the biggest problems that we ever had was stigmatization. Mm -hmm. Because if the patient is discharged, sometimes the family neglect them. We stigmatize them. Some of them will not even go to the market to purchase their food. They have to send people. So we make sure we go uh, to their homes, try to educate them about survivors, how they are vital to the community, especially once there is an outbreak in a particular com uh, community, they can help in the process and uh, how they started welcoming them. He was welcomed into those communities and he helped patients who recovered. Harry's recognized the wisdom of the recovered patient and turned a negative situation into one of community strength. Through his insight and community education, he broke down barriers, facilitated survivors to go home, reconnect with their families, and in that process, strengthen families and communities. This example to me exemplifies public health nursing and follows in the footsteps of nursing leaders like Florence Nightingale, whose bicentennial, again, we commemorate, as well as Lillian Wald, um, who really, um, did amazing things for, for nursing and public health right here in New York City. She was the founder of the Visiting Nurse Service. A nurse and community activist, she launched not only the VNS, but many other community-based programs for those who are most vulnerable. It is a model of care that is still used throughout the world and rings true today, now as much as ever. Thank you. Hello everybody, this is Mwansa Kowane from Zambia. I send you greetings from Zambia in the sun. I hope you are doing well in spite of the COVID-19 which is affecting all our lives. Anyway, work goes on and sharing what we have learned is a critical part of moving forward. It is both a privilege and honor to be part of the esteemed group working on the Columbia University project on the front lines, nursing leadership in pandemics. I believe that this project touches on aspects of nursing that are often neglected. Firstly, nursing leadership experience on nursing services during pandemics. And secondly, how nursing services are efficiently delivered in disease pandemics. Having the opportunity to explore and record what really happens at the front line is an indispensable reference point for the provision of nursing care and support to nurses and their families during pandemics. In August 2019, as a team, we visited two countries, Liberia and Sierra Leone, that experienced the most devastating Ebola disease outbreak in recent times. My interview with Christiana Conte from Sierra Leone stands out, but this does not make the other interviews less valuable. Christiana is a nurse leader who was in the forefront of the epidemic. She is also someone who was personally affected as she lost her own brother, a surgeon, to Ebola. She understands the dangers of spread of the Ebola virus. Though she acted in accordance with the rules of burial, it was difficult for her. She embodied the experiences of a health worker and those of community members. During your work, did you come in contact with grieving families or lost um, uh, colleagues? Not only really coming into contact with grieving families, I was also in grief. I lost a brother who was a consultant. 
one of the daughters, the specialist that we lost, or somebody. And uh, a closest friend to me died. The entire family went to my court. So that gave me the zeal to actually be more committed. And it added a passion in me for infection control. Because I know if there was that knowledge of infection control, they would not have died. Because you can imagine a specialist, a surgeon, he had so much passion that even during the outbreak, you know, he was still performing surgery. He became infected, and of course, so the family work. My closest friend, she was also a nursing sister, a retired nursing sister, lost the entire family. The only surviving daughter she had was in Australia. That's why she didn't die. And the entire household died. There are several key lessons that came out of this interview with her. For example, the difficulty of trying to work in a high-risk environment. This proved to take an emotional toll on health workers who not only had to distance themselves from family members but risked their lives on a daily basis. The lack of resources in the healthcare system, access to sufficient resources and availability of essential supplies was only possible in the middle of the epidemic, reflecting lack of preparedness. Technical support of agencies such as CDC and WHO were critical in mitigating such health crises. Doctors potentially were being part of the problem. The voices of nurses were not being heard adequately and their opinions were not being valued despite their first-hand information. Although nurses were slowly beginning to be respected as time passed, they still had no real influence. With regard to cultural norms and practices, there was a noticeable stubbornness to continue cultural norms and practices despite risk of disease transmission. There is therefore increased likelihood that another outbreak would still have a devastating impact. Overall, lack of awareness or just plain ignoring the dangers of the spread remains common. Issues like washing of corpses and other burial traditions, contact with infected family members and traditional healers who treated cases still occurs. Although Ebola was successfully stopped in Sierra Leone and Liberia, they still need for continued sensitization of both public and healthcare workers on basic but critical preventive measures. There's also the need for continued standardized training and adherence to healthcare policies and recommendations. These are important steps to prevent future outbreaks. Another important but overlooked element is the need for mental health and emotional support for health workers. From my observations, Christiana as a nurse leader is a strong advocate for nursing, but she has emotional and mental health needs. Such support is critical. What I would want to say, nurses actually have been very much instrumental and have been I, I can say the the, the 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 pivot of our success today and even the success of uh, contributing to the outbreak in 2014, 2015. Nurses have actually worked hard and they worked under difficult conditions and uh, but yet there is still commitment from the nurses, the healthcare workers they are committed because there is nothing else we can do just to save life, even with uh, the limited resources that we have still. But that commitment still stands. Even when you go around, you actually see what's warning. They want things to change, but because they don't have the opportunities, they don't have the capabilities, that, that, that's uh, one of the frustrations actually that we have. You want things to happen but you are not in authority to make sure it happens. So that's the frustration that nurses actually have. But by and large, nurses have been very much instrumental and uh, we've, kept, we've actually kept our, our 
promise, you know, our pledge to save the lives of our people in this part of the country. So that's our commitment, and we stand and we continue to do that. Even when I will retire, I would love to be a great mentor to nurses. That I promise to you. This brings me to the current COVID-19 pandemic. It bears the same hallmarks as the Ebola virus disease. It is a highly infectious disease, and nurses and other health workers are in the front line, risking their lives, depriving themselves of being with their families. What is clear is that globally, countries are not really prepared for disease pandemics. What we have learned from our border work would really help in ironing out some of these issues. It is my hope that once the work is done and documented, it will be widely disseminated and concrete action taken to minimize the shortcomings that seem to be reoccurring. I thank you once again for having me in the group as part of the Winds of Change for Nursing Leadership in the front lines. My name is Walmart James. I'm a visiting professor at Columbia and I teach in the Department of Political Science. Um, the Ebola virus um, infected 28,616 individuals from Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and killed 11,810 people. Um, 80, 881 doctors, nurses, and midwives were infected, and 513 died. Expressed another way, uh, Liberia lost 8% of its health employees, Sierra Leone 7% and Guinea 1%. An extreme case certainly because it has, it had a high uh, case fatality rate. The vulnerability of epidemic frontline health workers is the story of West Africa. It has been the story many times over during epidemic and pandemic outbreaks uh, over the last 100 years. And it certainly, as we know, it is a story today with COVID-19. And uh, because of that history and the enduring problems, it is uh, an area of policy concern um, which we will address uh, in our project uh, in five areas. Firstly, personal protection equipment, which has to do with the provision of masks, gloves, and suits. And what we require are international norms that regulate those. We require supply chains, we require the logistics uh, regarding distribution, uh, and we require obviously budgets to underwrite that. That's the first area. The second area of policy concern has to do with infection control and biohazard management systems. Uh, we need an environment where the international norms are applied, uh, and in particular where they are upheld on a daily basis by having rigorous accountability mechanisms in particular uh, health institutions. The third area of, of policy concern is to do with social support systems for families and communities uh, when health employers have to be quarantined. A fourth area of policy concern is to do with mental health support systems for employees working under duress uh, and having to deal with the trauma of absolutely awful triage uh, decisions about making decisions about who lives and who dies. And finally, uh, as a policy area, having guaranteed and uninterrupted salaries and supplementary wages uh, for the high-risk work that health workers on the front lines are performing. We are looking here at a social ethical contract of the greatest importance, and it is this, that governments cannot expect health workers to perform high-risk care without a guarantee that the greatest priority and the greatest emphasis is given to assuring that the frontline health workers are safe and secure. We are going to have a policy forum in September uh, that will address um, the policy challenges. And the policy challenges, to repeat, have to do with international norms, they have to do with domestic legislation, and they have to do with domestic regulations and budgets for systems reform and innovation. 
The political will to upgrade policies is nothing but clarity of purpose expressed in legislation backed up by landing it in the national annual budgets of countries. So I thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria Rosner, Dean of Academic Affairs at Columbia School of General Studies and a faculty member in the English department. After I've said my piece, we're gonna to move to questions um, from you all. So please go ahead and start to type your questions in the chat. But I wanna take a few minutes to expand on Wilma James's discussion of the policy implications of our work to consider another dimension that has informed our oral history of frontline nurses, and that's gender. From the beginning of this project, we've been attuned to two important facts. The first is that nurses and midwives make up the largest part of the professional healthcare workforce. And the second is that most nurses are women. Before we wrap up, I want to spend just a few minutes with you thinking about the significance of these facts, both for the nurses' stories you've just heard and for the future. Nurses play a critical role in working on the front lines of care during outbreaks of infectious disease. As you've heard today, nurses were key to turning around the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Out of a commitment to their profession and their communities, they continued to show up to work, putting their own safety at risk and delivering care in conditions of the greatest extremity. They created and upheld hygienic standards, devised protocols for infection control, built resilient teams, and convinced communities to embrace safer practices even when that meant abandoning cherished cultural traditions. In the end, nurses turned around a pandemic with an overall case mortality rate of 40%. And they did it in the context of supply shortages, a weak healthcare infrastructure, and the lack of either effective therapies or a vaccine. As you've heard in their stories today, nurses accomplished all this at a striking and continuing personal cost. Many lost their colleagues or their lives. Many suffered ostracism and abandonment and all gave up any semblance of a comfortable, normal life to respond to the crisis. They put themselves on the front line and they stayed until the job was done. In the midst of all this turmoil, the nurses we interviewed in our project learned a great deal quickly. When we asked them their ideas about how to prepare for future outbreaks, suggestions poured out about rapid conversion to crisis response, about navigating the complexities of PPE, about providing safe care to expectant mothers during an outbreak, about maintaining training and preparedness post-pandemic and much more. Yet, and here is the problem that motivated our project from the outset, the work and insight of nurses is often not considered when policymakers gather to discuss pandemic preparedness and response when crucial decisions are being made. This may seem impossible to believe, but it is a consequence of both the doctor-centered hierarchy of medical practice and the fact that nursing remains a profession in which women predominate. Although two of the interviews we shared tonight were with male nurses, the fact is that 80% of nurses in most regions of the world are women. Though women comprise 70% of the global health, force, health workforce overall, they hold only 25% of health leadership roles. These numbers are stark, but the situation they summarize is more complex. Many cultures think of women as natural caregivers, and in this context, nurses may be looked on not as professionals with the potential to lead and to drive policy and planning, but as women who instinctively provide care. One enormous consequence of the naturalization of women's work is that women are systematically underpaid for the work they do. The World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report for 2018 estimates the world gender pay gap at 16%, but that number is almost double in the healthcare sector. The predominance of women in nursing can propagate the stereotype that all nurses are women and that nurses and that women are meant to be caregivers, not leaders. Gender also intersects with race and class, compounding the readiness with which nurses' views are set aside and nurses' sacrifices are dismissed as ordinary, unworthy of recognition. Where are the memorials to the bravery and heroism of nurses who have given their lives in service when such recognition 
is given in professions that are gendered masculine, like soldiers or firefighters. The nurses interviewed in Liberia and Sierra Leone told us that they were still awaiting some form of professional or civic recognition for their roles in combating Ebola. The failure to incorporate nurses' knowledge is pervasive at all levels of healthcare workforce delivery from the top down. The World Health Organization had no role for nurses in its leadership team until 2017, when the WHO's very first chief nursing officer was named. An evaluation of 140 global health organizations found that 69% of the organizations and 80% of their boards were led by men. When the student associates who are part of our project did a broad survey of international health policy guidelines, they found almost no mentions of nurses. If nurses are not in leadership roles, then nurses are not being heard by policymakers. And the essential knowledge that nurses have, knowledge is born of front lines experience in pandemic outbreaks, does not find its way into policy guidelines and cannot guide our preparation for future outbreaks. The WHO often calls attention to what has been called the triple impact that will be felt when nurses are given their due. First, better health, because nurses deliver most health care. Second, stronger economies because a healthier population is more productive. And third, greater gender equality, which benefits all. Today in 2020, there can be no doubt that valuing the work of frontline nurses and taking guidance from their experience is in the best interest of everyone. When we began work on this project in 2018, COVID-19 had not yet emerged as a threat. Yet the stories of the Ebola nurses have obvious and tremendous resonance for our contemporary moment. We will soon be posting excerpts from the oral history interviews on our website, now in development, frontlinenurses.org. We need to listen to these stories to understand and appreciate the role of nurses in pandemic outbreaks. And we need to learn from nurses how to do it better next time, knowing very well that next time has already turned into now. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Mary Marshall Clark, who's going to moderate our discussion. Well, I'm always enriched by seeing all of you and tonight hearing from you and the amazing nurses in West Africa has been truly inspiring. I have a question for you all um, while we wait for others to type their questions. And that's for you who have lived and worked outside of the United States in Africa. Well, I don't know, you're, you're from South Africa and you play a role there in, in thinking through policy around these issues. But also the other two of you who've lived and worked in those situations, what have you seen change since the Ebola epidemic in 24, at its height in 2014? Has WHO reached out to make any, anything happen that has made a difference? Were lessons learned? So thank you for that question, um, Mary Marshall. Um, so the difference has been shaped by a few really dramatic events. The most important of which is the establishment of the Africa Center for Disease Control, which is a continent-wide public health agency um, and is the most promising agency of the African Union. It is divided into five regions in the country. Uh, and those five regions are also regional public health institutes, and they have all member states um, uh, belonging to them. And every one of the member states are busy with developing or having public health institutes. So our ability to respond uh, to outbreaks as a continent has improved vastly with the support of the WHO, with the support of the American CDC and other agencies, uh, including the Chinese uh, CDC as well. And you saw the difference it made in Central Africa in, in fact, uh, essentially rolling back the Ebola outbreak there completely, albeit with the help of a vaccine this time. So there's been major differences, but um, Africa starts off with a rather low baseline. Things have been improved, and you can see that we are struggling with COVID-19 today, um, but we are much better prepared in different parts of the continent. To, do, to deal with uh, epidemic outbreaks. I can add uh, to uh, Wilmot's response. I think we have definitely seen uh, tangible improvements at the uh, highest level. We now see uh, the joint external evaluation of government's plans and processes 
for health security of countries. There now is a very detailed list of parameters that countries need to work towards using this external evaluation mechanism. Unfortunately, uh, on the ground, uh, I, we now have a very large program in Sierra Leone, have been there since uh, 2014, so over the last six years. And we are working with midwifery schools, for midwifery schools to strengthen training. And I can say that support for nursing education and training has definitely increased. There is now an infection control unit at the Ministry of Health. Uh, there is a lot of support for global, the global health security agenda funding through the US government. And we have funds through them to strengthen the emergency operation center, the field epidemiology training, program, uh, data use, and early warning signs, etc. But I must be honest, the basic infrastructure needs that are the environmental controls that will sustain a response during a crisis have not improved. Um, one of the hospitals that we work at has no running water. And it's the largest midwifery hospital in the country. And this is the reality, even after millions of dollars were, were brought into West Africa for Ebola. And these infrastructure improvements are very expensive, but are fundamental to safe and effective care. And as um, uh, Wilmot has said, it is, it is unacceptable that health workers go into situations where their safety cannot be secured. I lost a friend a colleague, a health worker in Tanzania yesterday, and many, many nurses in the United States and abroad and other health workers and frontline essential workers are losing their lives. And the protective equipment exists to protect us. We don't send people in to address hazardous equipment or to do demining activity without the necessary protective equipment. Why do we send in nurses with much less than they need to keep alive? Jennifer, did you want to answer? And then we're uh, to let the participants know, uh, we're going to extend this dialogue by 10 minutes and we have some questions coming in. I just wanted to add that I think it's always an uphill battle for nurses to be um, part, heard and be part of the discussion within very significant changes within African countries, as Wilmot has highlighted. And uh, we do operate in most countries under very medicalized systems uh, that have not really heard nurses and put nurses at the front line. And that is, I, I think, an issue. Of we're on the front line, papers everywhere, we're demonstrating, we're, everyone says, well, congratulations on International Nurses Day today in the papers. Uh, will we be allowed at the policy table? Will our voices be heard to change um, long-term fundamental uh, policies for public health for all, inclusive for all in this country? That remains to be seen. Thank you. And we have an initial question I'm going to throw to you as well. Do nurses in the United States have any influence or any stake on state, stake in state and national policies being developed for COVID-19? I think that's a continuation of what I was saying. I think we're, um, it's, everyone knows about our contribution now. People going into the hospitals, the community centers, the bravery uh, of nurses with doctors, with all essential healthcare workers uh, that keep our, our system of care running. Um, the be, being in, at the policy table is a different issue. So I think the door has been pushed open and we will fight hard as we have historically. Nurses are survivors. We will fight hard to see that that door stays open in a fundamental revision of our healthcare system structure that does provide healthcare for all with health equity. Thank you. Uh, Mary Marshall? Um, yes. If I could just add to that, uh, there are nurses in leadership positions that are pushing in to help change the macro level. A colleague of mine, Dr. Sheila Davis, is a nurse and the director of Partners in Health. And in Massachusetts, they have led the training of contact tracers, some of which are nurses, others are 
um, unemployed restaurant workers, uh, teachers, and others who've been enlisted and trained uh, to be contact tracers. And Sheila's team through Partners in Health is, is expanding this work across the United States. So there are nurses in leadership positions having, having an impact, but the frontline nurse, the voice of the frontline nurse is too often not heard. Um, we hear it now in the news in sound bites, but they need to be at the table when policies are developed, when the budgets are developed, and when decisions are made on how healthcare will be delivered, because they at the front lines are there and know what is needed and what will be most efficient and effective. Thank you for that answer. Um, taking these questions in order, um, another one came up, uh, the theme of mental health has come up several times, and one person asks, what can oral historians do to take care of themselves? Uh, Jennifer has voted to, to wants to talk about that, but before we go to her, I'd just like to say that there's a webinar that actually our center gave a few weeks ago that's entirely devoted to that question, so we can post that for you to look at, listen to as well. Okay, Jennifer. One thing that struck me uh, when we conducted the oral histories uh, last August was that I would turn on the, the tape recorder and look the nurse or midwife in front of me and have her start to tell me her story. And it was as, as if it had happened yesterday. It was crystal clear. And sometimes I was the first person that she had actually told her whole story to. And the legacy of burnout, e emotional trauma, of um, living, still reliving the horrors of what they had seen within the context of they would go back and do it again if they were called upon. Uh, it was haunting to see and I witnessed the same thing with nurses and midwives uh, during the highest points of the HIV pandemic where mothers and babies were dying in front of our eyes and they had to absorb this. So I know for me is, is the oral story, one of the oral historians on this particular delegation it brought up all my memories, of what I had seen, um, but I take this lesson um, and now I'm working very hard for the School of Nursing to really provide forms, uh, circles of care for nurses and nursing students who are going into our major hospital. Because dealing with it now, letting people have space to hear what they witnessed, um, no judgment, no attempt to fix it, more to listen, is the beginning road to recovery and it's critically needed in this country. Uh, we're going to be seeing this for a long time as the effect of, of, of witnessing so much death and so much change uh, in people's lives who, who courageously have been on the front line. So it's an issue that is there uh, and needs to be addressed. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two related questions now for Susan. How is the how has the reputation of nurses changed since the Ebola epidemic? I guess this questioner means both there and here. Uh, how's opportunity for leadership roles or salary change? Have they improved? And connected with that, is anyone offering hazard pay in this pandemic? Well, I can answer the hazard pay first. In West Africa, during the Ebola outbreak, hazard pay was provided as an incentive to health workers, and uh, that was an important component of care. Although, as you've heard through the testimonies tonight and uh, my colleagues speaking, the nurses invariably would have gone in anyways, but the hazard pay did help to provide support to families at very difficult times. I can't say the conditions and the, the pay for nurses in, uh, in the countries where I work has drastically changed or improved. There is this um, sort of schizophrenic talk about nurses that they're the backbone and they are, they are the foundation, but at the same time, when we want to be at the table and discussing and, and making change, uh, then our voice is silenced. So um, I haven't seen the change at that level. I think the WHO uh, recognition of the year of the nurse and uh, 
having Elizabeth Eero as the chief nursing officer at the WHO is a, is a change. I think the triple impact report and the work of the Nursing Now campaign is really trying to push this, uh, but it tracks, as Victoria said, with women's issues. And as we know, they are um, very tough and stubborn to change views and, and policies and the salary divide. And this affects healthcare and it affects all of our health um, when we treat one gender very differently. And we see this pervasive in nursing. And although I would like to say Ebola has changed it, um, not dramatically. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Rebecca Garden. What would a structure of frontline informed policymaking look like? Just looking at PPE, at many hospital nurses are protesting the loss in leadership, says nurses don't understand supply issues and impose regulations restricting use. How can we approach this as a more than quote unquote culture in hospital health science center culture problems? Lamont. So that is a uh, absolutely fabulous question. Um, just to say that there is um, a fairly simple answer to some of these policy challenges. Uh, what you require is a system of consultation. Uh, and it's really important to have consultation with people who are right at the front lines of care because they know what they need uh, and there needs to be a feedback system. The epidemic response works extremely well when you have a highly effective chain of command. Um, because if you have a, a, a chain of command, you'll be able to press a button and things work. Um, but chains of commands in democratic systems are difficult things to get right. Um, and it's possible to have a balance between um, being able to be effective and efficient, but also taking into consideration uh, the needs of the people who are, in fact, animating the, the, the healthcare system. So um, there are systems of consultation and there are systems by which you structure decision making on the basis of those consultations and that's entirely possible to get right. Uh, what happens under emergency circumstances, people take shortcuts, institutions uh, then fail to consult. And as a result, you have many gaps in the system um, that you in fact cannot afford to have. Thank you. Um, I am not seeing any more questions right now, but there was one earlier one about whether or not this session will be avail available as a recording. Um, if I just may say, there is a question that you uh, missed. Um, oh, good, thank you. Also, and I was quite happy to answer the question. And the question is whether we as a society uh, failed to properly learn from the lessons of the Ebola epidemic in the light of the current COVID-19 response. And this is the story, is that um, Africa learned from the first Ebola outbreaks. In fact, there have been over 50 outbreaks in Africa. And there's been a long-term learning uh, process around that. And we saw what improvements had made in the case of the DRC. Uh, the corona outbreak history, the experience with SARS and MERS in Southeast Asia prepared them much better so that the ability of Southeast Asian countries to respond to a corona outbreak, a novel one like this, was much better. It seems as if countries have to go through a crisis before they actually learn any lessons. And otherwise, it just seems abstract to them. There's no doubt that the next time uh, the U.S. is hit with a coronavirus, it will respond a lot better because the gaps and the failures have been demonstrated. Now. So humanity seems to be find great difficulty in learning the lessons when the lessons seem to be abstract. So unfortunately, that's true. I think we should do a better job of being able to share lessons in a way that would arm the na arm nations and prepare countries uh, glo on a global scale to deal with what is a global phenomenon. Thank you. Mary, if I could add to the question about the uh, procurement. Mm -hmm. um, for the question around uh, the, the comment that nurses don't understand supply chain, and I would have to say that uh, that is not true. Um, nurses all across Africa uh, are the um, lead of, a, of clinics. They run the clinics. They are the matron in charge of clinics and they handle all of the supply chain and procurement um, 
for their clinics throughout most of Africa. And as a nurse who works in infection control, I knew that we were very vulnerable. Six years ago, I was at a meeting at the WHO on infection control, and we talked about how if something happened of this proportion, like COVID, how much trouble we would be in. We all knew that most of the PPE was made in China. This was known, and most of the supply in the United States is what is called just-in-time procurement. And that is a cost savings measure. That is a measure that's profit-driven. It is not driven by nurses not knowing what, what, how to use or how to ration PPE. It is done based on dollars and cents, and, and um, that is the truth. Nurses know how to use and use efficiently. We used our and reused our gloves all the time in, in Zimbabwe when I worked there. And we were very careful with our resources. And um, you need that frontline nurse to be the reality check. That frontline nurse will be the reality in the room saying, this is really what it's about. It's not about just-in-time procurement. OK, we're, thank you so much. We're wrapping up now. I have two questions from the same person I'm going to combine. Um, can doctors, are doctors perceived as allies in advocating for nurses' promotion to the policy table? Does curriculum education of nurses prepare them for self-advocacy, activism, administrative and senior administrative roles, negotiating with policy makers and shaping national budgets? Would that make a difference or is the issue simply sexism and devaluing of nursing profession? Who would like to take that? I can start with that. Um, I think that, um, of course, doctors are allies. Um, in terms of a nursing view, we see the whole team as allies in what we need to provide safe care for people. Um, and it really depends on the structures that have been built for healthcare. So we in the United States have a system that is run for profit. It's not a public health approach to care. It's a very hierarchical care approach. Uh, which means that we are under doctors. That doesn't mean that there aren't many, many doctors that we all are strong allies with and can look for change. Uh, I think the question is, what are we going to learn from the situation that we're in? Um, we, can, we do a lot of teaching and nursing curriculum on advocacy, on leadership, um, but we can't be the only one pushing up the mountain. It has to be a whole redesignation of a healthcare system. When, when you look at what have we learned from Ebola, um, and um, I'm talking to my colleagues uh, yesterday in both Liberia and Sierra Leone, they're ready with PPE, but they do not have the supplies. So they've kept up their training, but if they don't have access to getting supplies, how are they going to even respond now? Uh, in this country, there has been a systematic rejection of, of, of looking at this is important. We had a measles outbreak in 2014 from a um, very lackadaisical approach to me and not a public health approach for vaccinations. Uh, again, in 2019, another outbreak worldwide of measles. Um, we really have to fundamentally change if we're going to move forward with the voices of, of nurses uh, and our, all the power and wisdom we bring to really have a different public health system. And that will be a, quite a big struggle uh, to achieve. One that we will keep fighting um, with our Dr. Ellis, but it's, it is a question of what will we learn uh, since we have seen um, that this country has had a hard time learning on its own outbreaks. Okay. Um I'm just checking in with my team to see if we can take a couple more questions or we should end now. You, you can chat me. Can I um, speak to the question about training of nurses to be in advocacy and policy? Okay. I'm sorry. Susan? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, yes. I, I wanted to just respond to that question as well. Is it, is it that nurses need more training and, and understanding of policy and letter, legislation and leadership? And I used to think that, and I used to think nurses need to be trained more in this regard. Um, over the last decade, I, I, I've come to uh, not 
not see that as the main driver or limitation of nurses' voice being heard. And I've been in many meetings, very high level meetings, where once it is known that I'm a nurse, it's very difficult to get my voice heard. And I can just give, well, I can give many examples. Um, I, I can give an example of where I was responsible for a program that Jennifer actually led before me uh, that covered uh, 10 countries in Africa and 22 schools of nursing. And I talked to someone from the donor community and I asked his advice and I'm coming into this position already with 30 years of international experience um, and said, just any advice? And he said, just don't be shrill. So sexism is very much a part of this. I've sat with African nurses in meetings and encouraged them to hold their hand up in the meeting to be called upon. And one time I was with a nurse the entire meeting, had her hand up the entire time and she was never called upon. And doctors were talking back and forth with each other. And it, it's, it's very disheartening. Susan, very thank you. Thank you for that. I've been being told by my moderators that we need to close, and that's a really great thought to close on a serious thought. It's ridiculous that you're not being listened to. And, you know, the purpose of this project is to translate experiential and intellectual knowledge into public policy. We really appreciate your questions. As if we couldn't get to, please be assured we will meet and consider these questions and perhaps post them and, and some additional answers or have a follow-up. Um, thank you to everyone who supported this evening and please be well and please be safe.